On August 1, 2007, the I-35 West Bridge over the Mississippi River collapsed. There were 111 vehicles on the bridge, 18 construction workers were working on the bridge, and they fell some 115 feet into the Mississippi River. 13 people were killed and 140 were injured. The I-35 West Bridge was a continuous truss, eight-lane, 14-span bridge. The bridge was placed into service in 1967 at a cost of $5.2 million and handled roughly 140,000 vehicles per day. Why did it happen? It turns out it was a design error. The gusset plates, which connect the components of the truss structure to the upper deck, were not thick enough to handle the loads. This picture from June 12th of 2003 by the National Transportation Safety Board shows that in fact, four years prior to failure, some of the gusset plates had already buckled. That compromised their structural strength and compromised the load carrying capacity of the bridge. Now that you have an idea of the kind of damage that can be done by buckling, we want to talk a little bit about compressive loading. The book calls columns a member loaded in compression, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a column. It can be a plate, just like you saw, loaded in a somewhat complex way, so long as it is compressive loading. We will talk in this particular lecture about columns, but remember that there are all sorts of compressively loaded components that could actually fail. There are four categories of columns. There are long columns with central loading, intermediate length columns with central loading, and then we want to take the load slightly off of the centroid, which is called eccentric loading, and see what effect that has on the compressive response of the component. And then we want to talk about short columns, what we call struts, with eccentric loading. Now, the classic Euler buckling is related to these simple, compressively loaded slender beams. These are long columns with central loading, and we show here four different types of configurations of the columns. The one that usually everyone begins with what's called a pinned pinned column. So we have a pin at the top and a pin at the bottom for a column of length L. And that column then is loaded in compression. So we take this column of length L, we load it in compression, and we look at the load at which it becomes unstable. So we move from a nice aligned structural column in compression to one that buckles off to the side. That's a catastrophic loading state that causes a dramatic change in the display placement at the loaded end. If we fix both ends, top and bottom, and compress it, we know that the slope has to be zero at the fixed endpoints. And so the magnitude of the buckle and the wavelength, let's call it the wavelength, even though it's like a half wavelength, is going to be shorter in case B than case A. And in case C, we have one end fixed, the other end free. And so the wavelength of the buckle actually gets longer. It becomes twice as long, in fact. And the fourth case to the right right is one end pin, the other end fixed, we end up with a root 2 of, of times L, root 2 L length of the column. The Euler buckling formula for a pinned pinned structural column so that we are allowed to freely rotate about the, kit, the pins at each side of the column relates the critical load at which we experience buckling to the elastic modulus of the component, the moment of inertia of the component, and one over the square of the length of that component. You will notice that we can generalize that Euler column buckling formula to what is shown in equation 443, where the critical buckling load is again related to the elastic modulus, the moment of inertia and one over the square of the length, but we have a prefactor C. If we have pin pin columns, the prefactor is one. If they are fixed fixed, the prefactor is four. If one is fixed, one end is fixed and one end is free, the prefactor is one quarter. And for a pinned fixed, we get a prefactor of two. Those are important things. So 443 is the most general equation, and that is the equation you will usually use for a given column loaded in compression to figure out what the critical buckling load happens to be. You will notice that that critical buckling load will increase as you increase the elastic modulus. It will increase as you change the cross-sectional area so that you increase the moment of inertia, and it will increase if you make the column shorter. So the longer a column it is, the easier it is to buckle. So recommended values for the end conditions, there are these theoretical values where a pin pinned has a C equal one, a fixed fixed has a C factor of four, a fixed free has a C factor of one quarter, and a pinned 
fixed has a C factor of two. Well, those aren't very conservative. And so generally they want you to use a conservative value of either one or one quarter when you are calculating the critical buckling loads for compressively loaded columns. Now, the other thing that we like to do is we like to replace the polar moment of inertia with the radius of gyration. The radius of gyration is just the location where you would place all the area to get the same polar moment of inertia. And so it is a dimensional measurement that's related to the moment of inertia. If we replace I with AK squared, then we get equation 444, where the critical buckling load divided by the cross-sectional area, and that looks like a stress, doesn't it, is equal to the prefactor C times the square of pi times the elastic modulus divided by this L over K squared. And that L over K is given a special name. It's called the slenderness ratio. And it's used to classify columns according to their length category. P critical over A is the critical unit load. Yes, it looks like a stress and it's important to write it as a stress, but you have to be careful that you never think of it as a material property, as a mechanical property. It is a geometric property of the beam that allows for buck. Now, we can take that unit load and we can plot that as a stress along the y-axis and we can plot the slenderness ratio along the x-axis. And if we take the Euler buckling curve, you will notice that it depends on one over the square of the slenderness ratio. So we get this parabolic decay of the critical buckling load as a function of slenderness ratio. And it is often very useful to go ahead and draw a cutoff line at the yield stress along the y-axis. So that this is our first indication of a failure map. What that is telling us is that everything in the shaded area below the yield curve and the Euler buckling curve is safe from failure for the given slenderness ratios. If you move outside the shaded area, you are either going to get yield if you're to the left of the Euler buckling line and above the yield strength, or you're gonna get buckling if you're to the right of the Euler or buckling curve. Now, it turns out that this gray shaded area is a region where it's pretty hard to predict what's going to happen. It's hard to know whether or not you're going to get buckling or yield. And so there are a number of schemes that have been proposed to create a smoother transition between yield failure and buckling failure. And what they do is they identify a point T over here on the Euler buckling curve and identify a slenderness ratio associated with that, an L over K slenderness ratio. The intersection of the straight yield line with the Euler buckling curve is called the slenderness ratio Q, the L over K Q slenderness ratio. Well, we fit a continuous curve from the yield strength where the slenderness ratio is zero, and we fit a parabolic curve so that it's tangent to the point T, the L over K1 slenderness ratio. And then this pink shaded area Area becomes what is considered the safe area of operation so that you will get neither yield nor buckling when a column is loaded in compression. I already mentioned that what we are trying to do is create a failure map where everything down here in pink is safe operation while everything up above it that's up here and over here all of that stuff is failure. And so we are so we're trying to sort this out because we know that in this gray region we are uncertain what's going to happen. And so we create this parabolic curve which intersects PTR Euler buckling curve at the point T. And we, we generally assume that the stress, P critical over A, is equal to the yield strength over 2 at the value of T. And if so if we use that this critical stress is the yield strength divided by 2, then we can solve this L over K1 using the Euler buckling formula, and we come up with equation 445. So then what we do is we say that to the right of T, we're going to be using the Euler buckling equation. And to the left of T, we're going to be using this parabolic curve in here to determine the boundary between safe, which is below in pink, and failure, which is everywhere above those lines. 
So that's the task, and that, that is to fit this parabolic curve. So what we do is we assume that the parabolic curve has this general form, where the critical load divided by A is equal to A minus B times L over K squared. That's the slenderness ratio squared. If the parabola starts up here at SY, then that's where L over K is equal to zero. And so A is simply SY. To find B, we simply plug into the Euler buckling equation the, the value of this critical stress equal to one half the yield strength. Solve using this equation to find B, and we get equation right here. And this is known as the JB Johnson formula, which says that for slenderness ratios to the left of L over K1, we use the JB Johnson formula. And to the right of that, we simply use the Euler buckling formula. And of course, we have to know what our end conditions are so we can solve for C. For eccentrically loaded columns, what we are saying is that instead of the load being applied at the centroid, we are applying the load at some offset eccentricity E. So it's offset a bit, and that gives this load an initial moment arm before the column even buckles. And then as the column buckles, the moment arm at the midpoint of the buckle is magnified by the deflection of the column itself. So the moment becomes the applied load times the eccentricity plus the deflection. You plug that moment into the deflection equation, you get a second order differential equation that looks like that. You solve that with the boundary conditions and you get this interesting formula, which is shown here. You see the eccentricity, you see the force that's being applied P, the elastic modulus, the moment of inertia, and the length of the column. It's a complicated trigonometric function, but there you have it. At the mid span, x is equal to L over two, we find that the deflection is a magnified version of eccentricity using this secant formula right here. We plug that maximum moment in, and then we get this moment formula as shown in equation 448. Why is that useful? Well, the reason that is useful is because at the midpoint of the column, we have axial and bending loads. So we take an axial stress and a bending stress, and we can find the largest compressive stress. We substitute the maximum moment into that equation, and we get the maximum compressive stress that occurs in the column. It occurs at the midpoint of the column. Then we use the yield strength and compression, a maximum allowable value for that maximum compressive stress. We solve for P over A, and we obtain the secant formula for an eccentrically loaded column of length L. So the secant formula for that stress is given by equation 450. E times C over K squared is the eccentricity ratio. C is the end condition. And so what you find is that if we can parameterize these Euler buckling curves based upon the eccentricity ratio. So this is the Euler buckling curve, the outermost one out here is the classic Euler buckling curve where we have centroidal loading, the eccentricity is zero. And then as we increase the eccentricity ratio, we are driving the allowable loads downward to keep the column from yielding. The safe loading zone is always below your failure curve. And that failure curve is a combination of a parabolic yield and Euler buckling. We just end up with a family of curves that depend upon the eccentricity ratio.